Yes. So. Okay. So, uh, from where? So, uh, from Jodhpur only, uh, Jain view. Okay. Very good. Uh, so, very nice. So, which language you are learning here, Neha? Sir, I'm learning French A1. French A1. And how is going? So, it's uh, very good. We had uh, two classes, two to three mm. classes, and it was comfortable and fine. So, okay. very so interactive classes. Very good. Uh, Yanis will join back again uh, uh, because he had uh, last Saturday, I think he informed me that he didn't take the class, and uh, but he will compensate. Okay. He's from uh, France. So is he taking class also with you, Yannis? So he was not there. Uh, no, so he wasn't okay. there. Okay, then he must be taking A2 then. But he will, he will, uh, I have uh, talked to him that he will take also A1. Okay. Okay. Thank Very you, good. sir. Very good. So uh, Busra will moderate today uh, our culture program. And uh, uh, so we will listen to uh, Dharmendra. Yes, Busra, please go ahead. Okay. Yes. Greetings, my dear listeners. Marhaba, and every type of words we can use in different languages to show different cultures. My name is Busra, and I'll be a moderator for today's meeting. So as we all know, Umran uh, has this cultural program meeting every Tuesday at 9 o'clock. And the basic rules are that anyone is going to perform over here with whatever topics that they like. And they're going to inform us about something about their culture or anyone else's culture. So today we have Dharmendra Singh, who is a student of Spanish A1 level in Umran. And he's going to tell us about Meghalaya, the abode of clouds, home of India's indigenous matrilineal society. Dharmendra, now the stage is yours. Please begin. Ah, thank you. Thank you so much. Okay. And from uh, good evening to everyone. So uh, from the outset, let me apologize just a bit about the network disturbance, which I get quite often here in Meghalaya. And I'll tell you why. You will see why I'm saying that, because uh, I live in a place where it rains a lot. And the place which is nearby to me is called Mosindram yes. and Chirakunji. Yes. I'll show you a picture, maybe. And there it rains quite a lot, and we get quite a thunderstorm. So all the time we get this transformer, they get blown away. So that happens quite often. So please apologize. If I get disconnected, I'll try to reconnect one more time. So, OK, I'll start right away. And uh, let me share a, a slide, which I try to show. I think picture speaks better than uh, no, uh, I should be talking and talking. That will not do. So I thought maybe I'll show you something from my place where I have been staying. So I think that will do more justice to the topic. So, okay, you see properly, please confirm so that I could, okay, thank you, Rajin, thank you. So, uh, okay, the topic which I chose is uh, Meghalaya, which is, uh, in, it, it is a Sanskrit word actually, which means the abode of the cloud. It is made from two words, Megh and Alay, that is cloud and home. So it is the abode of cloud, that's what I have written there. And the title which I've chosen is the home of India's indigenous matrilineal society. So this is, it was quite new for me also when I came here to this place. Why it is unique, I'll tell you uh, in course of time. So let me begin right away. So uh, let me show you first. Okay, for all those people who are from India, they might be knowing, but for all those uh, people who are not from our place, and uh, okay, many people from uh, no, India also, they are not very much aware about the Northeast. So let me show you that this is the location, okay? So Meghal this is India, of course, and Meghalaya is one of the state of, uh, no, in the Northeast. So there it is. You can see the neighboring state of Bangladesh there. I mean, it's a different country. Then Myanmar is there. This side, we have the Bhutan. And then there is a China there. So, the, uh, so this is the location of Meghalaya there. And it is divided in so many, this is the state of Meghalaya, and it is divided in so many districts. So, okay, this is the administrative unit. And then I just wanted to show you the geographical setup. So you can see it right there, that it's more like a sea. This is a Brahmaputra River. Uh, so this is one of the biggest and broadest river in the world. So you can see it right there flowing between this Himalaya and this is the Meghalaya. So these are two mountains between them. We have the Assam Valley. 
And in between the flows, the Brahmaputra River, it comes from China. Actually, it starts from here. You can see the pointer of my mouse. Uh, so it comes from there in China and it enters here. Then it flows right there. So right there and it goes to Bangladesh right there. So there it is Brahmaputra and this is Meghalaya. So between the plains of Bangladesh and Assam, it is the a plateau. It's not really a mountain. It is a flat, like how to say a plateau. It's more like a tabletop land. So it's like a, you climb up, then it's like a flat land, entirely flat land. So it's like that. So, okay. And this is the geography which entirely, entirely decides the culture of the Meghalaya. Okay. So I'll be talking about a bit about the land and the people, how, what is the Meghalaya all about and how it is quite entirely different than the whole country. So let's begin right away. So uh, this Meghalaya, it is, uh, okay. I'll talk about land and the people. So it is inhabited by three tribes, which are Garo tribes, Khasi tribes, and Jantia tribes. So these are actually, how to say, it, these are languages. So based on the language, these tribes are named. So the Garo tribe, they speak Garo language. Khasi, they speak Khasi. And Jantia people, they speak, uh, again, Khasi language, of course. So I'll talk about that one also. And let me again come to this one. This whole street state can be divided into three hills. So on this side, on the west side, till here is the Garo Hills. From here till here is Garo Hills. From middle, from here till here is uh, uh, Khasi Hills. Then in the east, we have the Jantia Hills. So this is Garo, Khasi, and Jantia. I'm pretty sure you might have heard if you are there uh, you know, in India and you might have studied in your classes, history classes, geography classes, you might have heard of it, Garo, Khasi, and Jantia. And so uh, this is the setup which I am talking about. And uh, let me go ahead. So uh, first, I'll talk very briefly about the Garo and Jantia. Why? Because I live in Khasi Hills, and I'm more uh, informed about Khasi rather than talking about Garo, which I'm not very much, uh, I don't have much idea about them. So I'll present very briefly about the Garos. So Garos are Tibetu Burman uh, tribe. And they speak a language which is Garo, of course. Uh, it's a Tibeto Burman, it belongs to Tibeto language, you know, Burman language family, which is a. Has it gone? Uh, we we'll, we had lost you, Darvind. Yes, 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 Rajiv. Sorry, uh, it, it will keep happening time to time. Sorry, I can't help much. So, uh, uh, what was the last thing I was saying? Uh, could you tell me what was the last thing I was talking about? Uh, you were talking about the Garo tribes. Just started talking right, about right. Again. Thank you. Sorry, okay, okay. So, uh, because uh, no, it will keep happening. So, yeah, yeah. sorry about that. <laughs> yeah, okay. So yeah, I was talking about the Garu people. So they are the from Tibetu you know, uh, language family, and uh, okay, and uh, they live in uh, Meghalaya, which is again uh, the state I showed you, and also live in Assam and Tripura. These are the other neighboring states of uh, you no know, India, and a substantial population is found in Bangladesh, which is the neighboring state which I just showed you, you no know, uh, neighboring country. Okay, so. Uh, and that is the reason, I mean, that happened because, I mean, since we all know that the partition of India happened, so this was a Pakistan, so West Pakistan, and this became East Pakistan in 1971. Okay. They are all mostly converted to Christianity because of the missionary efforts long back in 1840s. And uh, it is said, I mean, though these tribes, all Khasi, Garo, Jantia, tribals, people usually, I mean, so, uh, all right. So uh, okay, you were uh, talking about Christianity. They were they were yes, 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 I can, I can see that. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry, sorry about that. Okay. So uh, then uh, there are since most of the tribal people they don't have uh, what you how to say that I mean a written literature. 
so uh, many times many times that tradition passes through the oral oral literature we all know we are all are familiar about that one so uh, according to one legend the uh, these uh, garut people migrated from tibet area from burma to india around 400 bc and they have a story about that one so that is the only record of history we get and the society in which they live are the matrilineal society so i mean in short matrilineal is uh, like uh, no a uh, kind of society which is different than ours we live in a okay we live in a patrilineal patriarchal society where uh, you know it is male dominated but uh, matrilineals are quite different one it is opposite of ours so there it is the you no know, women of the house it is the mother who really carries the name and who is the you know the guardian of the family so i'll talk about this one in detail later on and it is quite unique you will see so so in short what happens that in garus also uh, they the son they leave their house and they live in the bachelor dormitory you know bachelor dormitory when they are quite young like they are not married yet so they live in a small uh, community hall where all the guys of the village live together until they get married and post marriage what happens that like in our society particularly society what happens that uh, the girl marries and goes to the in-laws house to goes to the the man's house but here opposite happens here the man goes to the wife's house so okay so i'll talk this one in detail okay so next one uh, the tribe is uh, the jaintia tribe so jaintia are also known as you uh, know sintang and pnar so they uh, they speak khasi language okay uh, the one i'll be talking shortly and they are also matrilineal society okay so here I'll, i'll talk these things in detail and there are some of the festivals which you can see here the, that is called bejing klang festival and there's a lao festival there is satsu minsing which i'll maybe i'll take time uh, if we have time then i'll talk about that one later on okay this here the so, screen let I, me come uh, yes sir, but, you can see or not no no but uh, oh. we, but we were following up okay 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 today only when i am trying to make a i don't know in uh, presentation then this is going it's raining so that happens okay i i hope that you can see this one so okay so this is jaintias and so jaintias are also like a matrilineal society and you can see the screen right so uh not yet ha you know i can see it okay so uh, so what happens that then there Uh, it is that so they are also matrilineal society jaintias and they are kind of like a sub group of khasi people which i'll be talking in detail because i'm more familiar with the khasi and i live along amongst the khasi so i'll talk about that one. and this is the festival we i'm talking about so okay let me go ahead so i'll come directly to the khasis okay so khasi are the as no, no these people belong to the astro asiatic uh, language speaking group and i'll show you this one also and uh, they in a, like a, how to say like a, physically they belong to the mongoloid group and uh, there are so many story again uh, since they are the travels you know uh, many many we travel and which have been living in the mountain and hinterland so they don't have a quite a written literature that's why all their stories are passed via oral literature and their written story only started in 1840s when the again like i was saying the uh, you know uh the missionaries uh, came to Sh uh, shillong hills so uh they speak a language which is a mon khmer language uh, i'll show you a picture also and they are mostly again christians and uh, they are follow islam which is very uh, less population then they have their own indigenous uh, religion which they had before christianity which is called niam khasi or niam tre so they have their own uh, belief and there are still people who follow that one so maybe i'll give a brief about that niam khasi okay so this is the like a language family is entirely a different topic i can't take that one right here because i'm just trying to introduce the topic so this is the uh, map of the people who speak the austro asiatic languages and they are mostly you know this is the cambodia if you can see the map there it is mon khmer language is spoken there then there is a vietnam there and uh, then they have this is laos then we have thailand then we have indonesia and they have we have myanmar right join it so this is the khasi people here in india and these are the munda tribes if you have heard of them i think you are from uh, nearby bihar and jharkhand so you know munda people there 
बिरसा मुंडा वी हैड धर्मेंद्र यू आर नॉट ऑडिबल No problem, and he is facing problem, so no problem again. Yes, yes. Sorry. Yeah. Uh, yeah, okay, yeah. Fine. <laughs> okay, okay. <I'm laughs> Thank you very much. By, by the way, and it, yeah, yes. Okay, Rajiv. So, uh, okay. Uh, so uh, if you can see the presentation, uh, not yet. Uh, I guess uh, I, can? I can see okay. now. Yes. Sorry about that. Okay, uh, I, I am tired of apologizing all the time. Okay, so. There it is. So I was talking about the you now uh, Austro-Asiatic people who are in the language who they speak. So this is and quite then, unique because I mean there are only few tribes in India who actually speak this language. So they are Khasis, very secluded packets, and we are not even sure how come this happened that people from here speaking there, and maybe in a way we can trace the path of migration they came. So even they, even according to the Khasi legends, so even they don't know where they came from. They have no idea about that one. So the only reference we get is from their folklore, so the story they tell. So it, uh, so we follow their stories. We follow the all the physical references they make, like in Ramayana, Mahabharata. We think of the, all of the legends, or we look into the Bible, or we look in the Quran. Then we talk about all the physical location, what they're talking about. So we are following. So we follow that they actually came from this Brahmaputra Valley, from this side, and somewhere from here, China, somewhere here, this one, and Burma, somewhere from here they came. So we are not sure, but when we look at linguistically about the roots of the language, I mean, there are many so many words which are similar to this Mon Khmer of Cambodia. So we did, uh, deduce that they have might have come from there, from various parts of migration. If you have heard of this temple, Kamakya Temple in Guwahati, so there in Kamakya Temple in Guwahati, it is said. Okay, this is not. I'm not doing it. Somebody's doing it. Uh, this pencil. Okay, how is it happening? Okay, all right. So. The Kamakya Temple, it is said that it was originally a Khasi uh, site. I'm not sure, but there are so many legends about them. So, I mean, okay. All right. So, I'll move ahead. So, they have their own religion, which is like I was talking about, is Niam Khasi. So, they have three cardinal principles, which is same for all the religion, which I'm pretty sure. So, the, the first one is, uh, it says that Kamaya Hok, so which is right living and practice based on... Let please go. writing on a screen. Please do not write on a screen. Yeah. So, and the third one is about the Tipkur. Tipkur is, Kur is more about how to say the clan system. So they have very strong community bonding, very strong one. So everything is decided according to the clan system. And there is Tipka. Kai comes from the word May. So it's more like Tipka is about your own mother. So like I was saying, it's a matter in society that is a huge role of mother in everything and the whole like how to say it? like in our european language european uh, no indo european languages like our languages and uh, no german french spanish or hindi english most of the verbs what we get are the male dominated like chair man like that okay but in khasi most of the big things no important things big thing so they are mostly female like the sun is female and the moon is male so it's more like that so a tree is female, but a small branch is male. So like that. So there are quite, it's quite interesting to look at the language, how, you no know, language shows, uh, society shows that how there are changes in the language and how language is now gender. There is a role of gender there. So how a language becomes entirely female there. Like UNESCO, you might have heard of the, UNESCO is all the time talking about neutral language. That let's make the language not chair man or chair woman, let's say chair person. So again, in a chair person, there is a sun there. So that's again not neutral. Let's look at, okay. So UNESCO is talking about that one also. I wish I could show you the link, but still. So here in Khasi, since it is a kind of quite male, women dominated. So language, no, important things like rice. When rice is without, no, like it's still harvested from the no, uh, field, the paddy, it is male. 
because it is not used yet but when it is becomes a rice so it becomes like the white rice that becomes female so there are so many contortions to that one so okay so i'll move ahead and then i was since i was talking about the matrilineal so let me uh, no just talk briefly about what is it because people get confused actually when we say that it is a matrilineal society people think that women are all powerful and you no know, they own everything politically socially you know but that's not actually the case okay so let me define three words right here okay so the first matter in lineal lineal comes from the word lineage lineage means i mean my father and my grandfather and father and forefather and father and father that's how we say lineage so descendant so here in the matter lineal society what happens then wealth and property passes from mother to to their daughter not from son father to son so that's one second thing descent through mother line and what do you mean by descent through mother line it means that i'll take my surname from my mother rather than from my father which is the tradition so all the like uh, if i am my, my mother and father so my title my surname will be decided according to the my title of my mother not my father then it is the daughter okay it is a daughter uh, you can still hear me okay so it is the daughter who is actually the carrier and bearer of the tradition not the son why i explain you in the beginning that what happens that after the marriage son moves out from the house and goes to the wife house and daughter stays in the family and again there is a difference okay i'll talk about that one in detail there is one concept okay there it is so the second concept is matri local matri local like i just explained that man moves to the wife's house so you know local look uh, the whole location of the family is in the mother's house then uh, in khasi garo and jantia especially in the uh, in in khasi it is called ka khadu so khadu is the youngest daughter now again let me explain imagine in a family there are three daughters and one son so son marries and goes away now there are three daughters so who will be the actual bearer of the family usually in indian tradition it is the eldest son which carries the name but in khasi it is the youngest daughter the youngest one which will be the bearer of the ancestral property so she will be the one which will you know who will bear the family name and she will be the one who will you will address to she will be the custody custodian of your uh, ancestral property and all the ceremonies so even the mother and father they will stay with the youngest daughter and she will be the i mean how to say that uh, she will get the bigger chunk of the share of the property why because she is the one who is holding everything so okay let me move ahead the next one is a matriarchal now understand this concept we have patriarchal which we talk about all the time that man that dominates the women and the feminist feminist generation comes up that women are subjugated that we cannot all the political conversation comes now there are times when the you no know, men say here in sri lanka also here in meghalaya men feel and they say that no women are totally dominating us and it is the women who are bearing everything and we are getting not suppressed now again the problem of gender comes in other way women say that no women are suppressed but here men sometimes men say that no we are actually being suppressed that becomes a problem so what is matriarchal matriarchal is more about a political connotation it's not about us you know property it's more about uh, politics who owns the political power so here it is social system as this is what talks for decides okay well, women hold the primary power roles in political leadership and moral authority social privilege and control of the property rest of fine ex in it is true in the sense of uh, you know meghalaya except one sense that is political power here the meghalaya is matri linear and matri local but let me explain that it is not matriarchal and what i mean by that is women don't here hold political power at all okay so that's one thing they are not even though they own the property they are well educated they have power in the family but they do not hold political power so that okay and again so uh, there are so many okay in india we have these societies okay like in garo khasi jantia there are some other uh, uh, So they are uh, okay. In India, there are nice Thiyas and their Brahmins are Payyanur village. Okay, 
and also Malabar Muslims and some what you call that society in uh, Karnataka. They are also uh, matrilineal, matrilocal also, but they, again, they are not matriarchal. And it is said by many, many scholars around the world that these matrilineal societies are found everywhere in the world, okay, in a chunk, but they are definitely not matriarchal, where women don't hold too much of political power. They don't. Okay. Let me move ahead. So I was talking about the, you know, uh, like a matriarchal society again in China. So it is nearby border of India. That's why I took this, this one. So here it is a tribe called Mo Suo in China uh, and they live in this, uh, this area, Sichuan and Yuanyuan. Okay. So Yunnan province, there by. And here again, I'm in this one, uh, I don't know, I found it from that. And uh, it is called the Kingdom of Women. And women have their own choice of many men. I mean, which is true or not, I'm not sure, but okay. So here what happened, men don't live with their family, but with the mother, like I was talking about that one. Okay, let me move on. So next, so since I was talking about the, you know, the power of the women here in Meghalaya, so they do have economic power, like I was saying that they own ancestral land and uh, they also conduct quite a lot of business here in Sri Lanka. So you can see, there is a place called Bada Bajar, which you find many where in India. Bada Bajar, in traditionally, we can translate as Big Bazaar. Okay, you can see in the pictures that it is the women who are holding them. I mean, it is literally the case. Okay, I mean, I visit quite often there, and you can see that it is quite a traditional old market where women, you know, uh, bring all sorts of produce, you know, agricultural produce and local produce, and they sell in the market. So they are holding these betel nuts. This is one of the tradition in Meghalaya. People eat quite a lot, like. Uh, in India, like uh, the current tradition is that you visit some space, so you are offered tea, usually, you are offered tea. In Meghalaya, you are usually offered betel, okay, betel leaf with a betel nap, which they call it kwai. So it is tradition that, uh, no, you offer kwai to your guest. At the same time, during uh, earlier when people were very poor, so even the marriages, when you offer kwai to a girl, then you are offering your own uh, goodwill to her, you are showing your affection to her. To her. So, we see that these are the you know, marketplaces where women hold actually a uh, okay. uh, You can hear me? Could you confirm? Anyone? Uh, some we, we had this for a few seconds, we lost you, uh, but now I okay, can okay, hear okay. Yeah. Okay, okay. All right. So uh, I will not talk mostly about other things, but I'll just talk very few peculiar things about Meghalaya, okay, which I found very interesting and quite unique. So there is one thing called a living roots bridge. So, okay. So, yes, if your video is on, then I can know if you're following me. Thank you, Rajiv. <laughs> okay. So uh, this is called living root bridge. So there are a few peculiar things about Meghalaya. So I'll talk about that. Can you see that picture? Living Road Bridge? Okay, all right, perfect. So th this is Meghalaya, and these are the locations you can see. So it says the Rinping Men Road Bridge, Xinyang, Mao Lingnong, Masao, Umkar, and Umnoi. So these are the, some of the places. I mean, there are so many of them, actually. There are like 500 of the road bridge. They are big and small, and so many of them. But uh, even people of Meghalaya don't know much about them and their significance. So I'll be talking just a bit about this one. So you can see these are the living road bridge. So what, what I mean by living road bridge is that they're actually alive, they grow. So they are made from a root of a tree, which is called, uh, uh, which is called uh, Ficus Elastica. So it is a elastica, it's more like a rubber tree. We all know rubber plantation, it's like a rubber tree in Kerala we are planted. So it is one of the kind of a rubber tea and tree, and uh, it has these aerial roots, which we can see, aerial roots like you know, in mangrove forest. So using these roots, people found that since they are quite long, so through hand, they nurtured it over and over like an orchid. And over the, no, over the year, over the decades, okay, they trained the root, you know, like we train a plant, they trained the root to grow in a particular manner and they breaded it and they grew it and they have created these kind of suspension bridge. So you can see this is, is called double root bridge. So there are two of them and both are used, okay? And people use in the villages, okay? And they're found deep, deep inside the villages where you have to walk like, a, I don't know, 
there is one place called Nongriat where you have to walk 3,000 steps down to go there, and which people don't usually do unless you have a very good foot because you have to climb back out. So we go for trekking sometimes there. So there are so many of them. So you can see the road bridge there, there. And they are sometimes they're quite broad. You can see right here. And they have quite practical implications. Okay. They use it for their day to day life because earlier nobody was bothering about these deep, you know, uh, remote villages. So they created their own method. And during the rain time, like I said, Meghalaya, it rains all the time. So it gets flooded. So these are the bridge only you now helpful. I mean, they use it time to time. So there are some places you can see that this is the place. Okay, this is a Molingong Road Bridge. This is one of the most touristic places in the Meghalaya. You can see if you are around. And this is one bridge I want to show. This is the Rin Tiliang Bridge, which is almost like a 50 meter long. And this suspending high, deep height is like 230 foot above. Okay, it is, and they are flying right there. So you can see that how they have created to connect two hills there. Okay. So okay let me move ahead so one of the, another thing which i want to talk about meghalaya is about the cleanest village of asia okay and this is widely reported you can check online i mean india tv reported it all the time i mean you can see unesco reported it i mean it's always there so you can see in google cleanest village in asia you'll find that the places for mauling nong so this is one of the tradition which you can see right here people are cleaning it why i want to show this one is the thing is that like uh, the government of india is promoting more like uh, what do you call that uh, Clean air mission, so Swachh Bharat Abhiyan. People here, they don't need clean air mission because they have been practicing for centuries. This is their part of life. And let me tell you, I'll tell you personally, like my own locality where I'm living, people have annually, they do that once in a year, the whole state gets clean. Everybody cleans the whole city. And here, the, the place where I live, the person who owns this house, the okay, every morning what he does that, he goes out of the house, takes a morning walk, he looks around in the streets, if you find one scrap of paper right down on the street, he picks it up and takes it back home and throws it. That's how he does it. Even one plant which grows out of somewhere from the wall, he thinks that this is not needed there. He picks it up and you know, like and plucks it out and throw it somewhere. So that is the tradition they have here. Cleaning. They are how to say, I mean, it's like a negative connotation, but sometimes we call them cleaning freaks. Okay. They, the way they shine their houses, you should see them. Okay. So this is one of them. So let me move ahead. And yes, there is one thing called the sacred forest. Again, like I was telling, they're focused on tribal people, especially the Khasis Garojan, they are deeply, deeply attached to the nature. So they have huge significance for the mountains, rivers, and forests. So there are so many sacred forests in, uh, in Meghalaya. And the uh, good thing is that they are attached, they have uh, some religious significance, that's why they are saved. So this is one of them most famous is Maflong, okay, Maflong uh, Sacred Forest. This is the one, and they are there. Now, I haven't been inside yet. This is a morning trek. I have to go like four o'clock in the morning. So uh, I'll see around what is there. But usually they have a relig religious significance. And according to the Khasi lesson, you can't even pick a single leaf out of this forest. If you do, some misfortune happen, and people tell stories all about that. That guy came, he didn't listen, and he plucked that one branch, and they cut the tree, they took it there, they probably you know, turned down, they died, and all these kind of stories I hear all the all the time. So they tell us that, okay, don't bring, pluck even single tree, otherwise we can't guarantee what might happen. Oh, God protect me, God protect you, and never, never try to touch even a single thing there. Don't pluck even a fallen fruit, don't pick it up. So that, that is how they have been preserving this forest, and which is a good thing. And it has a quite deep rooted uh, religious significance, which I don't have time that I could have told you interesting stories about. But anyway, so I'll move ahead because I want to just uh, show some things about the place. This, there is one more thing which I want to show is about the monolith. So these are the huge monoliths. You can see them. I mean, I had one picture. Okay, there is one guy standing like that. I had my own pictures, many places, whatever places I've showed you. I've been there. But since I was told on Sunday that I have to make presentations, so I couldn't put them there. So mostly I have taken from net, but I could show them the my picture, which I have places I have visited. I I could have shown they are much uh, okay. So you can see them. So this is one of them, and it is like a, how much nine and a half meter long. So this is one single rock cut, and this is you can see it's more like a monolith palm. We call it the place. It's called Natyang, and there are these uh, monoliths you can see. Now, 
These monoliths have their own, again, uh, how to say, cultural significance, religious, I won't say, but they are, I mean, these kind of monoliths formed all around the world, but they have their own uh, religious connotation. But here in Meghalaya, okay, uh, here in Meghalaya, it is uh, now uh, more like, how to say, uh, I have a slot at home. Let me show and tell you if you have, I have to tell you how much time I have to talk about. So I think this might be last one already. So, uh, okay. So these uh, these monoliths, the one I'm showing you right here in the pictures, were raised by the Jantia kings, the tribal earlier day in Meghalaya. Before independence, we had 25 uh, tribal kingdoms here. We call them Siam. And the whole state is called Hima. So the Siams, the kings, they erected their own monuments. Maybe it was a sign of victories, or maybe it was a sign of significance to show that how grand they are, I'm not sure. So I found it there. So according to the local legend, the tallest monument, which is uh, the, there, right there, is the cluster by Mu Yong Siam, which is eight meter long, was erected by Umar Fil Falinki. Falinki was a trusted lieutenant of the Jantia king. And he erected this money monolith to commemorate his victory battle, like I said. So more like a kind of thing. I don't know, maybe there, it is their local Kutumina, could be. The monolith were erected approximately around 1500 AD. So this is a park, so different, different things. They all erected their own monuments. And this one is there in a district called Makirabad. So it's quite a good one. And it's like a whole circle there. You can find the monoliths from the people around there. Okay, I guess this was the last one I was talking about. Okay, and the last thing is about Shilong, of course. So Shillong is the capital city of Meghalaya, and again, it is a cosmopolitan city. I mean, not quite big, but uh, it is big according to the parameters of the northeast of India. And this is the center of the Shillong, and we call it Khatikhandat. Uh, so there are seven routes coming out from there. So this is an assembly building. You can see Meghalaya assembly building. This is center point, and these parts. Again, uh, Shillong uh, was the capital of uh, the whole Assam province when it was under the British till 1972, even post-independence till 1972, it was a capital of uh, whole Assam, which included the Tripura, Nagaland, Manipur, Muram, and all of them. So this was the capital city before it got partitioned, separated from uh, Assam, and uh, Guwahati became the capital of uh, no, Assam, and uh, Meghalaya became, uh, no, Shillong became the capital of Meghalaya. So again, you can find so many central universities, so many interesting places, uh, places in the street, and it's a quite, quite beautiful city. So that was about the Meghalaya in short. And uh, thank you, merci beaucoup, gracias. No, and there are so many There was a lady who jumped out of this waterfall, and uh, it was named after There's a story behind it, why she jumps, but. Uh, Unfortunately, I can't tell you the story right now, but uh, there's so many stories, but behind it, you can see seven sister falls. So there are the waterfalls there, and there are seven of them. And uh, since they are from, we have the seven northeastern states, so each one's a name after each of them. So seven sister fall, waterfalls there. Okay, so that was it for my presentation. If you have a question about anything, I'm open to listen and, and I'm open to answer it. Thank you very much for your attention. The participants may begin to ask questions if they have any questions to Dharmendra. Yes. Anyone? Hello. Yes, please go ahead. Yes. Yes, good evening, sir. Uh, my name is Mohammad Hussain, and uh, this is a very uh, interesting topic. But uh, I want to know, sir, uh, ask one question. Uh, mm -hmm. Is there Adivasi uh, live uh, the, uh, that reasons? And uh, if uh, they are living, so how can he spend his life? Uh, uh, maybe matlab, you, he, uh, they use internet, they use uh, phone or not? Uh -huh. Interesting. Okay. All right. Uh, how to respond to that? Okay. Let me give a simple analogy. Okay. So that will be quite interesting. Okay. Let's think about uh, a person who lives in Europe or America, and let's take our Indian, okay, Indian people, you and me, if you are from me, where are you from? I'm from India, Uttar Pradesh. Okay, you be from, okay, I'm from there only, okay, all right. So let me answer to you that one, okay. So there is one person who lives in US, there is one person who lives in India, and there is one person who lives in, uh, how to say, jungles of Chhattisgarh, okay. So difference is this, 
American might think that these Indians are backward and they're living like 200 years back. And you will think that these Chhattisgarh tribals, they live like, you know, they are like tribals living in a, don't think that tribals are still, no, around the world, they live, no, they, they wear this uh, leaf, leaves and they run naked in the forest. No, no, that does, doesn't happen. No, no, not at all. Okay. So like you said about the Adivasi, the term is widely misunderstood. The term Adivasi is quite misunderstood. Why? Because there are so much of variations where you're talking about actually Adivasi. Okay. So same way as Europeans. Now, when you talk about Europeans, the Western Germans and French, they are far advanced than the Eastern. Okay. So you look at the Romania or other places. So in a way, technologically, economically, they are, there are differences, but it doesn't mean that they are like backwards and okay. Same way, Adivasi in, uh, how to say, in uh, Meghalaya, they're quite advanced, let me tell you. They are the people who are totally westernized, like in Shillong. Uh, I was showing you the traditional dress, if you still can see it. Okay, let me show you the picture again. Okay, the one I was showing. Okay, these pictures like you see, and you get the idea that, okay, they are so backward. No, actually, they're not. Okay, they're quite, quite advanced, and they speak quite good English. Okay. So English is their state language and Khasi is the associate language, of course. So everyone, a taxi driver, even the woman who is sitting there right there in the market, okay, you can see that, right? The woman who see, sits there in the market, she speaks like very good English. So they're quite driven. But yes, difference comes when you go to the remote villages, like the one picture I was showing. So you go to the rivers, uh, remote villages. So many, many people, they haven't come out of their village in their life. They have never came out but doesn't mean they're backward. No, 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 they're not. They do speak English. Okay, I mean, not everybody speaks English, but they do speak their own language and they're quite educated, okay? And like you said, the internet, I, I lived in Delhi for quite a long time. I'm living in the capital, okay? I lived in Delhi quite a long time and I face all sorts of internet problem there. So how do you define that one? Okay, that's quite different, different. But we have very good connectivity, yes, so that's not a problem. People are very educated, quite, quite good educated, okay? So did I answer your question, uh, Mohammed Sen? Yeah. Or if you have supplementary yeah. question, I can still answer them. Okay. So yes, any other questions? Thank you, sir. Oh, welcome, welcome. Anyone would like to ask? Yes, if you have any questions, then okay. Okay, somebody's typing that. Okay. okay. So uh, again, I, let me add. Yes, Rajiv. Uh, I, actually, I, 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 I learned so many things. I didn't yeah, know. Yeah, go ahead, I mean, please. of course, I mean, uh, uh, I mean, uh, I cannot say that I know entire India, of course not. And, um, but uh, this was a quite interesting learning. Um, uh, when you, uh, you know, mention about this orality or oral tradition, uh, in terms of um, uh, the the whole message, uh, uh, you know, transformation, uh, uh, transferring the message, uh, the wisdom actually in the orality. This uh, their mm -hmm. history history lies in orality actually. Yeah. Uh, I'm, yeah. I mean, and, and it was quite interesting, to, uh, and that uh, makes me to think about that. Of course, I mean, I, I never knew that when you uh, show this uh, read, uh, picture of Shillong, I never, <laughs> I'm, I'm, for, forgive me for my ignorance, but never I searched that Shillong looks like this. I thought like Shillong looks like a mountain. <laughs> you no, know, right? actually, if I show you the picture of my house, maybe I should show you one picture, okay? Then you'll believe where do I live, okay? So let me show you one, okay? Okay, you go ahead, Rajiv, you have a question, okay? Let me find one. I, I might be keeping just on the next one. So go oh. ahead, yes. You were saying, uh, yeah, uh, uh, like you were saying about the orality. Yes, like if you really look at you no know, our own literature, like uh, no, I'll talk about my own literature, which is the Hindu literature. So by the time like it got written, which happened like uh, 1500 BC, before that we had all the Vedas and Puranas and all of the literature, religious literature. They were oral only. That's why we call them Veda and Shruti, right? So yes, you are right. And many people, I mean, usually we have min misconception about the you know, northeast that people are backward. Yes, I mean, the city, there are always differences between the village and the uh, you know, towns. Yes, that, that you will find. But uh, you know, still, people are quite educated here. I mean, uh, thanks to the missionaries who provided them education and uh, you know, hospitals and all of them around the city. 
so very interesting like uh, the the uh, the percentage of christianity is uh, higher than even muslim or uh, hindu uh, yes 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 it is i mean that you will find in the most of the northeastern states except assam i guess but in the, all the hill states that's how you'll find them and uh, okay since uh, we are talking about that one let me try to show uh, no i'll just just show you the google pictures only not right like that if can you see the tab there i see it didn't come yet it didn't come yet uh, but it will come okay, i think okay okay it takes few it seconds in a second yeah give it a few seconds not yet see the uh, uh, picture of silong i just see the picture of silong yes yes can you see yeah can you yeah, see no, that one no. yeah that's what yeah, i yeah. mean yes yeah, yeah. okay so this is the silong city if you can see it's a quite big one okay see the side one i won't put a big one but uh, see this is a city it's quite quite big one huge city of a population of very big population okay so it's not a backward city so like you know it's over there you can see so many churches there this is center from this is part of the city so there it is okay yes So, if you have any other comments, other questions, so you can go ahead. Anyone would like to say something? Well, uh, so, Sir Mendra, I would like to appreciate the hard work you put into it and how nicely you explained it all. It was really appreciated, and I guess Thank one day you. we'll come to Meghalaya to visit you. Oh yes, that you have to. I mean, you can. I mean, this is one of the places where where you don't need the ILP. So you can. You are always welcome to come and you look around. There are so many places. Okay. So for your information, since you mentioned uh, Busha, yeah. okay. Yeah, so Busha. there are two places which I forgot to mention. One is uh, Cherapunji and one is Mosinram. I am not sure whether you have heard of the name of the places, but uh, these sure. are the two cities. Mosinram currently holds the most wettest place on the earth. So. it rains around the city and it rains like uh, how much 900 cent, uh, inches a year in shillong it rains only 60 so i mean huge difference like so much of rain happens so it is the most rainiest place in cherapunji and mosinram both of them they are found in both hills one side one side yes so uh, that's quite a difference we have there yes 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 that is there so yes. i want to ask you one one more thing Yes, yes. Then, uh, when like if someone comes there, uh, what uh -huh. what is the best uh, medium to travel? Like you know, there. Uh, yeah, there, like uh, okay. Or, so, like, if you want to visit the place so first from the Guha, you can reach Guwahati Airport. That is there in uh, Assam. So from there, you always get a taxi. You can get the book taxi from there airport, and then you can take taxi. It will take three hours to come to Shillong, and. The, the journey itself from guwahati to shillong is wonderful it's a beautiful beautiful scenic city okay so the whole route is quite beautiful one you can reach shillong there are it's a quite you know tourist oriented city so you'll find hotel and residence everywhere no problem there food all sorts of food so no food problem like people usually get then from shillong you can go around you can book a cab and you can go around anywhere no problem there entirely no problem at all is it so is it there any trains going over there Uh, sorry the train train no 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 the, the train comes to guwahati only and uh, then suddenly the mountain starts so they don't have the train system here they have only you get down guwahati 3 hours come by taxi that's the best and you also enjoy the scenery no the place whole place no, yeah. no trains okay okay i mean is it like this in in in, in guwahati you uh, hire um, car yourself and uh, or the motorcycle motorbike uh, and then you uh, yes you can car. do that yes definitely that's what they do i mean uh, how to say that sundays and saturday and sundays are entirely flooded here why because all the people they come to guwahati they hire a bunch of those bikes okay and they roam around the whole state okay so usually you will hear all the known revving of the bikes and you'll see this himalayan mountain bikes and there will be group of some 10 15 20 bikers they will roam around all over the states and go to the places there so yes it's always there you can always hire your own self driving and how about the camping like uh, is it uh, oh, yes. convenient you let me know i'll arrange for you 
Don't oh, worry. I'm, I'm coming uh, yes, next yes, year. It, it is there. It is there. You can camp by the riverside under the no, <laughs> suspension bridge. So okay. don't worry about that. And oh. uh, one thing I discovered very recently. Okay, there are two things which I totally forgot to mention. Yeah. Okay. One thing is about uh, there is a village which uh, you know uh, the uh, evidence I saw only yesterday, but uh, there is a place uh, where, where all the have you seen this movie Avatar? You know the the English movie yes, yes. for the Oscar award. Yeah. Yes. So what happens that the guy he runs into the jungle, then suddenly all the light lights up. So the whole forest is glowing. So here yeah. also is a place where they have the system of what we call bioluminescence. Wow. So bioluminescence is the natural method of you no know, glowing. So there are plants like mushrooms and trees and plants which glow in the night so you turn off all the lights and you go and you see the whole path you can see and the whole way station is glowing you can search in the google you'll find it by wow. it's wonderful only yesterday i saw the evidence i haven't visited the place yet because it's very remote down but one of my friends she brought uh no uh, what do you call that a mushroom from <laughs> that forest and she showed me there in the bottle and i saw it was amazing to see i'm telling you I wish I could show you, but uh, I mean, I have to turn off my light and then I put it there, right there. So you'll see a spark of small no, tendrils of the mushroom. Oh, That's wow. one. Yeah. And second thing is there is a, a, a village called uh, Kong Thong. Okay. There mm -hmm. is a village called Kong Thong. Mm -hmm. There, what happens that, uh, uh, interesting, it recently got a UNESCO tag, like 15 days ago. Okay. You can search there. And uh, there, the mothers, they keep their names of the children. No, they call their children uh, by the whistle. So they whistle. Okay, mm. for each children, they have a unique whistle. So they whistle. Wow. They don't have, I mean, they do have a name, but okay. rather they prefer the whistling. So ah. they have four children, so they will have four different whistles to call them. That's how they do. This is their tradition for a very, very long time. Right. And uh, each whistle is different. I mean, if in a farm there are like 50 houses, so each one have unique whistle for their own kids so it's quite interesting and it got a unesco tag okay. 15 days ago so you can check wow. that you know whistling village of meghalaya <laughs> there is a whistling so village in, in 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 turkey also in um, oh, okay in okay okay series, i didn't know huh? that oh that's wonderful but okay. uh, i mean they they speak with the whistling <laughs> okay oh they speak with the whistling okay, okay. yeah okay. They, they develop language as, uh, in, in that form but in, okay, interesting. Okay. I mean, the, I mean, the, when you uh, when someone has the names with the sounds, name uh, with the whistling, uh, whistling yes. sounds, yes. whistling sounds, I mean, yes. that's uh, uh, amazing. <laughs> yes. So I don't know. I mean, I have to check in the YouTube to see. I mean, I haven't even explored yet. But if it's them on YouTube. I think I'll put, I'll find it there. And one MP, you know, a member of Parliament from the Bihar. I forgot his name. Jitendra somebody. He mm -hmm. adopted that that village. So oh. uh, it happened. Yeah, it happened. So he was the one who spearheaded, and it got the UNESCO tag. And oh, right. also the state has a world largest natural cave. So it is 24 kilometer long. And it, dis it got discovered like three years ago. So it is yet not open to the people because they are still discovering and lots of snake story here. So there. Amazing. I mean, it was a really amazing uh, information that you put in presentation. And I think you have traveled all around i think the northeast uh, uh, i try to but uh, given the how to say the you know, mountainous terrain it becomes difficult because we have to come back and other, otherwise you go and do the homestay then you can explore the you not know, deep down like i said about the nongria you have to go down three thousand steps and come back six thousand in a day in the mountain it's like uh, one day gone so oh. yes but uh, traveling around is needed here and it's quite quite wonderful places to explore. excellent I will welcome you in Istanbul and oh, I will thank you. you welcome me in Meghalaya. <laughs> you are welcome like tomorrow. <laughs> Not tomorrow, so, but yes, I, I mean, uh, yeah, very soon. Why, why I'm saying that? Because this is the time you can actually visit because it was raining. Rain hasn't stopped yet. So it rains all the time. But uh, during November till uh, February, it is a good time to come. So you can see the clean water, like uh, okay. the picture I put in the presentation. So it, it is the best time is to visit to, in February? Yes, because that time less rain and there are crystal oh. clear water. Oh. So there is a place called a Doki on the no, Bangladesh border. The river mm -hmm. Umgat is so, so clean and so clear that it's green and it's like a glass. So oh. what you see, it looks like it is floating in the air. I see. So no, the, one, the one I put on the front page, it yeah. was there. Yeah. I think it wasn't a very good picture. But that was the answer. Uh, interesting. So, wow. That's, that's a, so how I about the in see, July, July, September? It's coming July. July September, 
if you like, really want to enjoy like uh, no, how to say that if you want to visit rajasthan visit in the summer should hmm. we say that or you want to visit simla then visit in the snowfall so oh, want to see okay. actually the meghalaya the green meghalaya then come in the rain time you will see everywhere can you see the page that the one i am showing right now yes, yes 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 you that was the picture i was talking about yeah, no, yeah, okay. river yeah. wow you can see that no actually that's not a very good picture because i put the very low resolution yeah but i see if you actually look at it the boat looks like you know it's like a flowing floating like yes Flo- yeah floating like thing there <laughs> yeah floating oh, in there it's amazing amazing i mean wow. i am not going to promote the tourism for why are this but no i mean I you did it that, you, know, you already did it <laughs> yeah i mean yeah i wanted to present the more like a sociological and cultural aspect of it yes. why because those are unique culture i mean uh, tourist place you can find all the time so yeah so i, I oh, can't man. even stop talking about them so thank thank you very much uh, darbend um and it was a really very uh, exciting presentation um i hope like all the audience uh, will get inspired from this uh, to to talk about their culture or where they have lived um and um, and inform us as well thank you very much busra also uh, for moderating and thank you very much all the audience uh, for your uh, patience and the learning uh, yes yes busra thank you so much thank you so much rajiv and all the you know participants who are you know fellow language learners thank you so much thank you very much uh, the mainra yes then can i assume that if uh, one day inshallah will come there so you would be our guide like you please, know the way please, is better please than please us please come around <laughs> yeah yeah oh definitely uh, i'll leave uh, do you want uh, should should i leave my email id there uh yeah sure you can send it on the group if you don't mind okay i'll just no no not at all not at all you can uh, okay i'll just type it there maybe i'll give my official id or something that will be much better okay so you can i'll just send it right away uh, you can write to either of them so okay yes, i think you should see that is really kind of you thank you okay you are welcome to them uh well, so thank you very much and then uh, see you again for the ne- next tuesday uh, next tuesday akshat kumar you are talking about you are going to talk about bihar akshat kumar hey rajiv hi yes. akshat here yes so you are going to talk, uh, talk about bihar uh, next tuesday right yep 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 very good excellent excellent and then neha will be talking about uh, rajasthan <laughs> uh following that uh, tuesday <laughs> Yes, sir. Excellent. See you then. Thank you very much, and see you again. Thank you. Assalamu alaikum. Thank you. Namaste. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you, right. Thank you, Dharmendra. You have really nicely uh, put on the show about the Shillong because I recently visited uh, Sikkim like few weeks back, two or three weeks back. Uh-huh. So I could totally relate to okay. the. You know, mm-hmm. I was I was literally enjoying it, and I was uh, feeling as if that I was still there in the. mountain range and in the himalayan uh-huh. range so let so, let me uh, tell you that uh, mountains of sikkim and mountain of shillong are entirely different one quite quite different one you visit the place you will see feel the difference yep 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 it's yep. a culture I'm, which I'm, actually uh, makes the place so yes okay awesome, thank awesome. you awesome i'm really looking forward to it and i'm i'm glad that you have shared your email id so hopefully inshallah once i uh, visit uh, shillong then obviously i'll definitely get in touch with you so that you could show us around sure 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 okay thank you yeah thank you darmin Thank you guys. Have a great night. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye.